I will stay there. Ok, boa noite. Boa noite a todos que estão aqui presentes. Boa noite a quem está nos assistindo pelos canais que a gente está transmitindo também, fazendo streaming hoje à noite. É, obrigado à CIP pela, pela gentileza de ceder aqui as instalações do grupo de amigos do Weizmann. Uh, a palestra aqui do professor Scherz, a, a Victor Scherz, será em inglês. Ou através do ter alguma então, e a ideia é que ele faça essa apresentação e depois siga para perguntar. Mas para começar, eu queria falar algumas palavras sobre o Weizmann e a, a história do Dr. Victor Pers e a razão pela qual ele está aqui no Brasil. O Instituto Weizmann é, é, é pesquisa pesquisa pura Israel foi criado muito antes só para existir o Estado e é hoje uma, uma, uma das joias da, humani, da, da humanidade, eu diria só do Estado de Israel pela sua contribuição fabulosa faz das descobertas científicas hoje boa parcela dos, dos principais remédios vem, tiveram a sua origem patentes desenvolvidas no Weizmann essas décadas de as novas fronteiras do conhecimento científico abertas e evoluídas através das, das muitas combinações de pesquisa e resultado que acontece. Uma das car características mais interessantes do Weizmann é o fato de que a ciência lá é multidisciplinar, integrada em diversos departamentos. Embora tenha área de física, de química, de biologia, de ciências matemáticas, ciências computacionais, os cientistas trabalham de é muito. E a pesquisa do professor Ernst é um espetacular exemplo desse processo. Ele é um professor do departamento de plantas, e você pensaria o que tem a ver o professor do departamento de plantas com uma pesquisa ligada a câncer de próstata. A única coisa que existe em comum foi a, 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 a união do Scherz e o Paulo do Instituto Weizmann interessado na pesquisa de câncer, e eles chegaram à conclusão que alguns fenômenos da natureza, que essa é a grande, grande linha de raciocínio do científico no Weizmann, é, é a busca e o desenvolvimento a partir da curiosidade científica. Os cientistas curiosos com a natureza descobriram que há um fenômeno da natureza muito apropriado ao tratamento das plantas que podia ser transferido, transplantado para tratamento é, de determinados tipos. Foi essa maravilhosa descoberta que a liderança do professor Scherz, o Instituto Weizmann conseguiu, é, conseguiu ah, transformou-se numa para transformar remédio e que mudou para um determinado tipo de situação de câncer de próstata. Foi completamente um jogo para transformar certos, certas doenças de câncer como algo uh, menos letal que a gente conhece. Na, na... So, professor Victor Chess, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to have you here. In, uh, in Brazil, I was saying a few words mentioning that uh, one of the beauty that things that we have at Weizmann is the integration of different fields. The fact that you come from the plant uh, department, your connection with the scientists from uh, biology and other centers allowed uh, Weizmann and your team to find the big, uh, important discovery like you are going to explain us to us. Uh, us here that changes the uh, the boundaries of knowledge in the game in terms of trying to fight cancer, move it uh, to new frontier. We're, we're all also very happy to have uh, your wife here, Zehava uh, Shares. 
who is part of the uh, another side, a very important side of the vitamin issues related to education for, for science, use of new tools for scientific education, something that we are also uh, another group led by, by who uh, back bring it to Brazil. So we are expanding the connections we have between Brazil and Weizmann. This event this week where Professor Avigdor came for a conference here is also part of this strategy. So thank you very much for spending the time with us. We were going to have your, uh, your presentation and then some uh, after this. Uh, but you need, you need the mic for the trans, trans, transmission. Yes. Works. Okay. Okay. So, um, in a few minutes, you will see what do we mean by saying vascular targeted photodynamic therapy. Uh, all in all, this is the new concept. And I will try to describe to this audience the way that we went uh, from the bench, which means the lab, into the clinic, which means treatment of human being, treatment of people. And uh, within my talk, I'll try to give you the sense of the evolution of a new paradigm and what Mario talked about, the multidisciplinary approach, or what I prefer to call the multidimensional work because at the end you don't know where it comes from, uh, whether the ideas have developed in chemistry, in physics, in biology, because it integrates everything. Uh, how does it bring to this kind of an evolution? And before starting my talk, I have please. I have to acknowledge my dear late friend, Professor Yoram Salomon, with whom I did um, most of this uh, preparation of the new idea, the evolution of the new idea, and he died about uh, a year and a half ago. Unfortunately, being able just to see the preliminary approval of the drug in Europe and in Mexico, not being able to see all what we are attending today. So, um, uh, as you may have heard already some time ago, uh, the whole concept starts from recognition of the tumor as a kind of an organ. And what we mean to say uh, is that it is not just a heap, a bunch of no plastic cells, cancer cells, that are bad to our body, but it is a whole organ. It has um, cancer cells, it has uh, extracellular matrix which is made of what we call a fibroblast, a collagen. It has immune cells that infiltrate it, and rather than fighting against the cancer cells, are enslaved by the cancer cells and start to protect the tumor from other immune cells that want to annihilate it. It has blood vessels that feed these cells and make them grow, and eventually infiltrate into the vessels and find remote places to colonize it, to be seeded it, and to establish metastasis. So it's an organ. It has all the elements of an organ, but this is a bad organ. It's a malfunctioning organ. It's an organ that we would like to get rid of. Now, interestingly, nature made uh, several means and several ways to get rid of malfunctioning organs. I don't know how I can make turn into a movie. Anybody? Well, uh, this is a movie. So what, what this movie shows, I will describe to you. Uh, you see that there are some bugs here on the leaf. And then all of a sudden, and, and probably most of you have some pots at home with plants, right? And when you have some problem, either you forget to 
uh, wet them um, or to water them, or there are some bugs that are going on the leaves. All of a sudden, you start to see that there are press here, press here. Never mind. This is why I like to show my own movies. Um, so what happens is that you start to have white stains here, and you probably have it at home on pots. All of a sudden, there are leaves with white uh, pots. Um, and then the, the, the leaf drop out. And you have a very similar phenomena in human when all of a sudden you have a phenomenon known as sepsis or ischemia reperfusion injury, where a whole organ like the lung or the heart fails. And it starts by having some, some ischemia, some part of it do not get oxygen, and within a few hours, the whole thing collapses. And the common thing to the two of them is the idea that these are malfunctioning organ, and nature produce in these areas to be destroyed these two kinds of what we call radicals, nitric oxide and oxygen radicals. I'm not sure how many of you heard the term nitric oxide radicals, but you probably heard oxygen radicals that are good, that are bad, that are not good for our uh, health, and we try to avoid them. These two things are the common universal weapon of nature, whether it's in the plant kingdom or in the animal kingdom, to destroy organs that do not function very well. The problem with that is that in general, in general, these are produced throughout the body. You have, for instance, bacteremia, some bacteria that go into your blood. It triggers the uh, activation of white blood cells and they start to shoot these radicals in the blood, everywhere. And therefore, you can have organs that will collapse, that you do not want them to collapse, but they are weak. They do not function well. And if we want to use this exact methodology to cancer therapy, assuming that the cancer, the tumor, is a malfunction organ, we have to make it complete. So our vision was quite simple, to develop a method that will enable treatment of the cancer at the early localized stage where we can see it. And I don't know if you are aware to, but in the last years, we have more and more cancers that we can identify and recognize at earlier stages than it was several years ago, what we call early detection, early observation. But we don't have still the means to treat this early detected cancer. Let's say that we do, that's what we try to invent. So the idea is to treat the primary tumors, to remove them, maybe to have anti-tumor immunity, not the pro-tumor that I just described a few minutes ago, and you know immunity is good for us. Immunity is vaccination. We are able to develop this anti-tumor. Fantastic. And then get rid of the cancer, and get rid of what we call early micrometastasis, non-detectable metastasis, and thereby getting possible cure. This was our vision. And at the later stage, what we call disseminated stage, where the cancer starts to spread over the body, again, to get rid of primary or metastatic tumors that we can see, but at the same time, develop anti-tumor immunity that will lead to annihilation of this non-detectable metastasis, and thereby preventing the progression of the cancer front, get stabilization, or maybe even regression and cure of the vision. And let's see whether we made some important steps in. So um, since this is a little bit educational lecture on the developing of the idea, and how it came, I want to show you the normal cycle of development from bench to clinic. And then I will come back to what we did to shorten this process very much. So we start with an idea. This is a curiosity-driven idea in the lab. And our curiosity-driven idea was, can we imply this method used by nature into treatment of two? So we had the idea. Uh, we then show in animal studies that indeed it works. We can get rid of tumor grafted and implanted into the animal. We then found a company, or they found us, that wanted very much to get the license from Yeda, the commercial brand company Istiba, 
on that time it was um, um, called uh, differently. Since then they sold all what they had and they invested all the money, uh, Egmal Irad invested all the money into uh, this project. And then we got into what we call IND investigator, um, uh, initiated investigator drug, uh, ap not approval, but approved to do clinical trials. So we made phase one clinical trial. We got into some kind of clinical response. The answer was uh, yes. If we will get a negative clinical response, we'll have to go back to our bench to change the working hypothesis to start this whole cycle. And since we got yes, we continue to clinical study phase two and three. And finally, we got registration permission for commercial use. Now, this cycle took 23 years. And this is not very long from the very basic idea, from the very initial research. And Daniel Zeifman, our president, just um, is, is, is presenting a book that was published a few years ago saying that in general, there are 30 years of development from the basic idea into the drug. In this time, many things can be changed. The idea can be obsolete. Um, so you have to see what is the future. And what we have now is a different way of doing the things. We collaborate with the leading cancer doctors in the world at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in Oxford, <coughs> in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And therefore, we phrase our basic research question right on the beginning in a medical relevant manner. So we found an idea how we can ablate tumors, and we are going to try it seven years from then, or three years, or four years, in clinical indication that the doctor tell us this is going to, to, be, to work, this is relevant, not just in the air and then after several years come and say, what is the tumor that fits us? And because of that, the first stage, rather than taking 10 years, takes four years, and I will show you at the end, the second stage from phase one, getting into phase one to take, took two to three years, and we hope that with the phase three, we shall have a, another three or four years until getting an approval, namely a cycle of about 10 years altogether. That's where we are. This is the development of the idea, and now I want to show you a little bit on what I'm talking about, okay? After we set the stage of how the idea is developed, what is the evolution, what is the basic principle, I would like to show you the therapy itself. So the therapy comprises two elements. One element is a drug, a new drug invented in our laboratories, and the other one is light. And this light is what we call near-infrared light, which means it's, non, uh, it's in the range that is non-toxic, it's non-thermal, and the drug is non-thermal, non-toxic, do nothing, does nothing in the dark, okay? This drug is called Tucat. It's a derivative of a pigment called bacteriochlorophyll. Some of you may remember chlorophyll, bacteriochlorophyll for your studies of photosynthesis. This is the universal light collector. It has been designed by nature to do one thing, collect solar energy and turn it into a radical formation. And you remember, I said in the beginning, in the second or third slide, we need radicals. We need oxygen radicals. We need the production. So we found the means to turn light into radicals. Okay? This is done with the chlorophyll. However, in nature, this drug is very unstable. Once you take it out of the plant milieu, put it on the shelf, it will decompose itself because it's so active that if the plant degrades, it can ruin the whole plant. So we had to do two, several chemical modification. It took us several years, at least 200 compounds, before we found this compound that is called Tucat. And now we have something that is stable, can stay on the shelf in a certain four to five degrees for about five years. Nothing happened, can be applied pharmaceutically. So uh, next, again, this is PT. Probably the movie cannot work here. Uh, again, this is what I was afraid of. But what you see here in this encircled area, that within five minutes, this entire circle, which is the tumor, all the blood vessels here are completely closed, whereas the rest of the body, although the drug goes in the circulation, the drug is everywhere, the light is everywhere, only the tumor is completely annihilated. It's completely uh, 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 safe. What do we do here? We take this tucat, we inject it to the animal, IV, 
intravenous in, uh, um, infusion for several minutes. And then we turn on the light. The drug is everywhere in the circulation. It does not leave the circulation. It stays in the blood. And it clears from the animal within several minutes. The half lifetime, what we call is seven minutes in the rodents. It's about 40 to 60 minutes in human, as we'll see in a minute. I hope the other movie will work. Uh, but then within that time, we illuminate the tumor. But we also illuminate some non-tumor blood vessels. S still, only the vessels of the tumor are getting closed very rapidly. It's pity that you cannot see it, but let's go to the next one. So what happens after the blood vessels of the tumor are closed, constricted, we start to have production of radicals that go from the vessels outside into the cancer cells, into all the tumor cells, not only the cancer, the immune cell, the fibroblast, everything. So for a few minutes, <coughs> we turn the blood vessels that are called usually lifelines, we turn them into death lines. They produce radicals that start a chain reaction that propagate from the vessels into the tumor and within six to eight hours destroy the entire thing, ablate the whole tumor in a fairly specific manner. This takes a few hours, that's it. Now, uh, this works. So here is how the method works. You uh, put optical fibers in the area that you want to illuminate. These optical fibers are connected to uh, a, a laser, a laser, near infrared laser. You then turn, um, uh, you inject the drug for about 10 minutes, and then you start illumination for about 20 minutes. And at the end of these 20 minutes, the entire tumor is gone. And it will continue to work for about six to eight hours. And after eight, maybe 16 hours, you will see a black hole. If you do an MRI of this tumor, you will see just a black hole and we'll see it in a minute. So the first clinical application was what we call focal therapy to prostate cancer. Now, this early stage prostate cancer usually appears as a lesion in one part of the prostate of men. Of course, women do not have it, fortunately. Um, and unfortunately, breast cancer, which is usually taken to be a women disease, 8% of men may suffer from it. So, not justice, but that's facts of life. So, uh, so we have usually the post that is made of two lobes, and usually one of them contains the initial uh, cancer, the initial tumor, which is called the index lesion. However, Usually, in addition to this well-observed uh, lesion, you may have some that you cannot observe by biopsies or even by MRI. So we decided we are going to take the whole, the whole half of the prostate out, but remember, we want to do it in a very safe manner. So now come the, comes the trick, and this is the biology of the prostate. The prostate is surrounded by what we call fascia. This is a kind of collagenic tissue which is semi-reflectance. Now, uh, as I've said today in, in the lecture that I, I gave in, in Sao Carlos, um, this is Brazil, right? And most of you are doing one way or another barbecue, right? I mean, one way or another. And so I don't know how many of you are using uh, chicken and not the real thing. But when you open the chicken, you have this internal organ covered, what we call the fascia. This is a, very, a shiny kind of tissue that envelops the internal organs. Fortunately for us, the prostate is surrounded by three layers of fascia. First one separates between the body of the prostate and the nerve bundles, which remember, we want to maintain. This is the potency, this is part of the manhood. Second fascia cover both of them, and the third one help to separate the rectum from the body of the, of the uh, prostate. And this is very important. Why? Because if we want to take, to get rid of a tumor inside here, we put optical fibers in several points that are planned a priori by what is called two guide. This is a program, interactive program, that tells us where should we put the optical fibers. 
We put them through the perineum. These are very, very thin optical fibers, and it's practically non-invasive. The patient wakes up, no bleeding, nothing, does not actually feel that it has any kind of fibers penetrating, but we put them, and now, when we turn on the light, there is a kind of a magic. This fascia reflects back the light. So a very minor part of the light goes into the nerve bundle. Most of it are reflected back. So it means that there will be a homogeneous light field, in particular in the periphery, where many of the tumors are. Now we can treat all the prostate because it's non-thermal, because it does not affect the collagenic tissue. And what you have at the end is the markation of the damage. This is MRI taking seven days after the treatment. All this black hole means necrosis, complete ablation of the tissue. And you can see very nicely how the contours of this ablation comes together, overlaps critically with the fascia, the first fascia of the prostate. No damage to the nerve bundle, no damage to the ureter, um, practically one or two percent of incontinence, a very small percentage of, of uh, impotency, no comparison between this and the radical prostatectomy. This is what happens when you do whole ablation in two sections, in two times. This is what happens when you do hemiablation, only one lobe. You can see, again, very clear demarcation that nicely overlap with the fascia. This is the uh, first publication of the phase three clinical trial that was done about two years ago. And this actually provided us with the uh, European Medicinal Association approval uh, and, the, and the European community uh, for commercialization. Since then, we have four and, and five years follow-up publication. And what you can see, this is after two years, but this maintains after four years, is that when you compare the disease progression in the treated patient and in the active surveillance patient, you have a huge difference between those that survive progression. You see here only 20% progress. Here close to 60% of the non-treated active surveillance people progressed. And when you go uh, and look at the different parts of it, you see that we can equally treat the entire prostate, whether it's the apex, where we have the first sphincter that, that control the urination, whether it's in the periphery, in the base, whether it's in the uh, middle. We have very similar results in all these patients, in all these treatments. So we can treat the entire prostate without any difference. This is in sharp contrast to other methodologies such as high-intensity uh, ultrasound, uh, which are thermal, uh, brachytherapy, which is also thermal, or cryotherapy, which is cooled down, but it's also called thermal. All of them do not really differentiate between the different parts of the prostate, and therefore you have a very high percentage of erectile dysfunction, high percentage of um, incontinence, and you cannot treat the entire prostate because you don't want to make it even uh, more severe. Uh, and that's actually when you look at the patient that went into radical treatment because of treatment failure, you can see that after four years, only 20% of the patient that undergo VTP went into radical prostatectomy, with no problems, by the way. There is no problem of salvage therapy. Unlike uh, when a patient undergoes radiation therapy or HIFU, it's very difficult to get the prostate out after because it's all like molded together. It's stuck to each other. You cannot really get it out. <coughs> uh, this is unlike uh, VTP, where you can easily, same, same difficulty that you have in um, operating on, on a naive patient is after doing the VTP, no difference at all. We have only 20% that turn into radical prostatectomy compared to more than 50% of the patients that have not been treated. This is a huge difference. That's why uh, more and more centers will accept it, and I guess that right now we are going to the uh, uh, more advanced. Now, in the e at the end of my talk, I would like just to briefly describe what we are doing now with the disseminated disease. The interesting thing is that the uh, impact of VTP in the, on the tissue is very dramatic. It's what we call necrosis, and as I've told you in the beginning, this is the way nature selected to destroy malfunctioning organs. So it's not only because it's abrupt, immediate, very fast, take it all out. It's also because this kind of death of an organ 
provoke very strong immune response. And this immunity is against the element of this malfunction organ that becomes something wrong with, okay? Now, this evolution is because the cells are immediately broken, the cell membrane, they spread all kinds of elements within to the system. The system learns to recognize them, produce T cells, and have a memory now. So if this kind of malfunctioning cells or malfunctioning organization of cells will happen again, the autoimmune will uh, attack it, will try to prevent it. Now, in some cases, it's not enough, and therefore we add some immune modulation. Now, the immune modulation that we add is not the very expensive one that you heard about, the checkpoint inhibitors, which cost about um, $80,000 per each treatment. These are very simple drugs that are used today in chemotherapy, but we use them in metronomic quantities, very, very small quantities that have no effect on the patient as standalone therapy. The only thing that they do is temporarily to decay the elements of pro-tumor immunity. They peel off the walls that protect the tumor or the micrometastasis from the anti-tumor immune cells, those T cells that I mentioned just a minute ago. So the combination of the two things led to this percentage of cure in different animal models. For example, with the triple negative breast cancer, no other lab was able to show any percentage of cure, delay a little bit, yes, in the animal models, we got 60 to 70% complete cure of this disease. We have the same thing with the bladder cancer, with esophageal cancer, and this led to several clinical trials that have been started of al already four and a half years after we started with the preclinical research. That's what I was calling the shortening of the time. Remember, usually it takes about 12 years to get to this. Here, after four years, we started with these trials. They are ongoing now in Memorial Sloan Catering, and more is way. I think that with this, I will thank you for your attention, and let's hope that next year I'll have some new things. Well, first of all, it's, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I am involved with Weizmann for, you know, maybe 12, 13 years. And what is fascinating for all of us is to, to watch these things develop. And, uh, and I feel that, uh, you know, I feel like nature has all the answers, the questions, even to the questions we don't have. But if, if you look carefully, as you, as you demonstrated here, the answers for the most of the enigmas we have in life including life itself and how to prolong or, or what causes life to be shortened are written somewhere. And due to the scientists of the world, we can really li live in a world where lots of these enigmatic questions came answered. Lots of the problems that we have uh, uh, found solutions. So it's very fascinating for us, not from the scientific world to see your, you know, long-term uh, 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 tenacity looking for some of these uh, solutions that you have to translate from nature into, into something practical like a drug in this case. But in order to open up with the first question, uh, my curiosity is what was the initial point when you, coming from the plant science, were you at lunch with the guy from biology? discussing this nature phenomenon like photosynthesis and how the, the connection between the two things uh, really begin? Well, um, uh, as I'm saying uh, many times, and I have discussion with my wife on the uh, use of the term need. What does it mean need? And what is curiosity? I think curiosity is also a need. It's a need embedded in us, uh, not only as human nature, but you know, uh, it says that the curiosity killed the cat. Uh, also, animals have some curiosity. And the curiosity goes on, on many levels. And one level, uh, I think, the, uh, in the human being, is the need. Uh, is, is can I find a solution when I need some solution? I needed a solution for uh, cancer therapy. Uh, there was a case 
a family that I needed to solve, and I tried to think uh, what are the elements that I have in my hands that can help me solve it. And then not very far from what you described, I met Yoram Salomon in the corridor of the uh, uh, previous Ullman building. Uh, I knew Yoram Salomon from childhood because he was uh, the brother of uh, a friend that studied with me in the same class. And uh, I met him and I asked him if he has, uh, on that, that time I thought of targeting in a different way. I said if he has anything that I can hook chemically to uh, this kind of molecules in order to target the cancer. Uh, and this is how it begins, and Johan was quite excited. And so we uh, started to think together. I, I, it's not that I came from plant sciences. I actually, a physicist and, and chemist uh, in my education, and I did some uh, quantum chemistry and computation and so forth. And so very rapidly, uh, uh, Johan, who had experience in animal studies, um, and I put uh, <laughs> the question of how can we do this and that and that. And so uh, we developed and, and we saw that uh, this kind of photodynamic therapy, which people have been used for uh, quite a few years by that time, without any deep penetration into the mainstay therapies, have a lot of losses that you have to change. And uh, the idea was really to go and follow nature. And so um, you just have to, to get an open mind and to look around and, and to see if there are solutions. As you said um, rightly, uh, there are a lot of solutions in nature. You just have to look for them and to ask yourself um, what is the problem and how did uh, nature solve it and can I do it backward in my own lab. And so that's how we developed. We were lucky enough and uh, in the beginning to have uh, the company that came in and, and wanted to license it. I think that uh, the name of the game here is collaboration. Uh, it's, it's a very deep collaboration. It is not just that two labs are working, you know, one here, one there, and, and change some ideas, and you have the money to go from one place to the other. It's really working together. And this went out throughout the research. What I described is Memorial Sloan Kettering um, there was a moment that we got the, really the best clinician in the world. As you all may know, if you went to a clinician or not, you have an ego the size of this building, not the size of the room. And what we said then, and, and people here liked it, and, and also I discussed it with Zazie because she's coming from a different angle to what I'm going to say. Let's take all our egos, put it in a basket, call it community ego, and then try to grow up with this community ego. Uh, because everyone will benefit from it. And more than that, grants that are usually given to competing groups will be used in a much better way. And at that stage, you know, after we went through industry uh, and, and so forth, we were lucky enough to have the uh, Thompson Family Foundation, who decided after very thorough looking and, and consultation with uh, leading scientists and clinicians in the world, that they do want to support it. And so we were able to get a huge grant that uh, with the obligation that within four years from the second grant, we are going to launch into the clinical trials. This is unheard of, uh, and we dare to say it. And we are there. We stood all because all of a sudden there were no limitation. People started to share. We had the conference on the pancreatic cancer uh, uh, of close to 30 groups at the Weizmann Institute just in the last summer, or actually the beginning of the winter in December. And all of a sudden, people that usually fought against each other in science, you know, did not show anything to, to anybody before they published it. All of a sudden, yeah, come to my lab, I will show you that. All of a sudden, there was a total collaboration. Let's solve it together. And I think this is uh, the whole evolution. So you ask how I arrived to that and what we do, that's it. Questions? For people uh, on the screen. Um, I am not from the medical field, but uh, I understood that uh, the tumor is um, annihilated by necrosis because it's a lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen. Well, this is um, part of it. it. There are two parts. The first one is ischemia. Okay. It's okay. the lack of oxygen. Yes. But this is not all of it. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know how many of you have confronted problem of heart attack. 
uh, and things like this in fault. Uh, you have first of all ischemia, but then you have a burst of oxygen that people try to get in. And in the beginning, when they try to assess it, the uh, people that underwent a uh, stroke, they put oxygen and the people died. Why? Because the oxygen came into an oxygen lack environment. And because of that, the oxygen molecule turned into radicals. They undergo a reduction. They, went, they got electrons. They become radicals. And this is what made the very serious damage, the reperfusion injury, what we call. It's the same kind of sepsis when you combine the two things. So it's, first of all, the blockade of the blood that go in. But this does not make them death lines, just prevent their lifeline. But then when they try to reopen in order to get more blood in, all of a sudden you have the second effect. And there is a third effect that I did not talk because this is a bit complicated, which is how to maintain homeostasis. There is endothelin one. I don't want to get into it. But the idea is that within minutes you turn them into radical produce. But anyhow, um, how works? How it um, differences between the vessels, the, the vessels that are from the tumor and the ones that are beside the tumor? Okay, so there are two things here. Number one, the vessels in the tumor are much more fragile. They are inherently different because they grow fast. And you know, again, um, uh, without any insult, when after we came back uh, from our first time in India, I uh, used to put it like uh, when you built up a house, at least uh, this was in our first visit, uh, you put the, um, how do you call it, you know, the, the sticks and everything to support the building up. There is no, it looks like there is no order. Uh, it's not like in a Western building where you have, you know, everything. It's just in and there, and, and somehow it, it comes out. It comes out very nicely at the end. So this is how the blood vessels of the tumor look like. There is no order. Every cell that feel a little bit under uh, um, uh, low oxygen recruit new blood vessels. And so you have no, no order. They do not grow well. They are very fragile. And more than that, they already have a lot of nitric oxide in there. So this is probably what makes the differentiation. The whole tumor is much more vulnerable in terms of the blood vessel. However, as you could see with the prostate, we destroy half of the prostate, which has normal tissue and non-normal tissue. But here again, the vessels there were uh, few, were very small, and this kind of bystander effect is probably what makes it uh, the, the total uh, damage with the biological intervention that I described. So. Um. Uh, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, totally agree with you about the collaboration. We cannot do very good work as you did uh, alone. Of course, the collaborations are the most important. Uh, I am a professor here at the University of São Paulo uh, at the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I also, I am working in the develop, development of one anti-leukemic cell, uh, med medicine. Uh, and then I have some questions, some curiosities. Okay? The first one was the time. During 23 years, uh, how could you manage the patent of this uh, new molecule? Uh, how could you, did, have you patented yeah, oh, obviously, no. we have like, uh, uh, I think, 14 or 15 patent families that have been already given numbers. Uh, we have many more that I did not present here, uh, specific targeting by, since you're in pharmacology, uh, RGD integrin receptors. We have new molecules for radio, heteronostic, where we put into this molecule copper 64 that enable us to see the tumors, the metastasis well, uh, we just recently developed them and tried them in school because they have the radio chemistry laboratory to do it. Uh, so everything has been patented. It was uh, initiated by the institute, the first payment, the first registration, all the patent owned by the institute. Uh, the last ones uh, that we get now is the immune modulation are uh, co-owned by uh, STEBA, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the Weizmann Institute. Uh, so, um, 
in terms of basic research versus patent application and so forth, this is usually a dilemma of the researcher. I had no dilemma in that respect because I thought that uh, if these things will not be patented, there is no chance that they will go into the industry. No industry will take them. And uh, it seemed to me more important than, than having first the publication. So uh, if this answers your question. Yes, answered. Yeah, I have many questions, but I would like to, to do only two more. Uh, this is the preclinical the, the preclinical <laughs> studies. Have you done everything in your institute, or was this done by collaboration? For example, with mouse. Have you, for example, used cancer mouse studied the effect? Yeah, of the we have. Uh, here comes again um, the institute. Um, the institute, as Mario and other people know, uh, put a lot of attention into what we call the preclinical arena. There is a lot of philanthropy going there, so we have a wonderful facility for animal uh, studies, which is very expensive, um, but it competes with the best places in the world. Uh, we are now expanding it because there are so many experiments. We can work on rodents. Uh, uh, so mouse, mice, uh, rats. Uh, I did not show anything, but we have uh, two very interesting development in ophthalmology, where we use this drug not uh, as an antivascular, but topical application for treatment of keratoconus and myopia, um, which looks very, very good, uh, in particular degenerative myopia. Um, and so we are doing rabbits experiments. Uh, when we need to go to pigs, to large animal models for toxicity and safety, this was, is done now with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Although, with all the holiness of Israel, we do have some facilities here that you can kill pigs. Actually, it's uh, probably encouraged by the religious uh, parties, as many as you kill. Uh, but, but yes, we do have the facilities. Again, the whole infrastructure of the institute uh, is based both on competitive grants and philanthropy, and and the income of the uh, patents of the uh, of the disease that we cure. Uh, so we are good at it. We are very good. <laughs> it's something we are using, like, um, and and I hope nobody will kill me here because this is for <laughs> good reason. We are using about two thousand mice a year. Uh, and quite a few hundreds of threats. Uh, it, it would be impossible to get any conclusion. And the beauty of the method is that you can directly translate what you see in the animals into the human. It's unbelievable because it does not have complicated cellular pathways. It's um, straightforward biology and physics. Last question. Uh, how is the uh, political uh, for exchange students Exchange, professor exchange between, for example, your institute and also uh, our university, for example. I will tell you um, um, straightforward. We encourage exchanges very much. Uh, I think that uh, my group has a very interesting composition. Uh, first of all, there is one uh, male and, uh, well, actually two. The rest are, what's that? Uh, no, no, it was always um, a very heavy, uh, quite dominated by women. They come from very different origin. Uh, you know, you have um, people that are coming from Moroccan, Algerian, uh, Russian, uh, South American. This diversity is essential to me because it, it really uh, provides uh, out-of-the-box thinking. And, and the cultural aspect of it is extremely important. Uh, and that's one of the major reasons that we encourage uh, students from abroad, uh, students and uh, fellows and professors to come and visit the institute, because you have a lot of new ideas then. And when I looked here, uh, I was in the conference today, I found um, we already start to discuss having doctors coming from here to Israel, to the Weizmann Institute, as well as postdoc fellowships. We'll have to discuss it. There was a very high excitement about that. Um, you have a um, very good engineering and physics department there uh, that can contribute to our efforts very much. And you have also very strong photodynamic groups here uh, that 
in many aspects try, I would say, to go in the old traditional way of having photochemotherapy, but um, are very excited to try a very new way. Uh, so, yes, I think Maybe that... Just to add two words uh, on this, we have uh, started back uh, tw 12 of more years ago uh, uh, the process of sending uh, Brazilian students to the summer program uh, in Israel. There's a summer program in July every year with a group of uh, maybe 70, 80 students from all over the world, and we send four from Brazil. Uh, to this. So we already have sent more than 50, 60 um, uh, first year in the university students from Brazil. And uh, this week we just finished the selection process uh, where we, out of 470 candidates, we selected the best four. It's amazing the quality of these kids when they go, and it's amazing also the, trans the impact on their lives we, because we, we follow them. So, and then, and then on that, so, so the, the, the connection between Brazil and the vitamin starts with that level. Then we already have some projects with FAPESP, which is a place here where we have budget for incentive, in, to, to incentivate uh, science research, where we combine researchers from Brazil with Weizmann in doubles. So we are increasing the number of projects that we have for that. And then we're, we're talking about the exchange of, of postdoc level as well. So we, we see lots of interest, including from phil phil philanthropy institutions and foundations uh, to help move Brazil from the, from the way we are today, from uh, the point we are in terms of science to, to, to new grounds. But this need uh, a lot of changes in, uh, in our uh, uh, approach to science in, in Brazil. But uh, we'll, the connection between Brazil and Weizmann is moving this as well. Next question. Hi. Um, thank you for your lecture. Um, other than the lack of the reflective tissue that you have in the prostate, are there any other reasons why you can't use this treatment in other parts of the body? Or it's less efficient? Well, but I just said that we started already three new clinical trials, upper urinary tract, uh, esophageal cancer, and, uh, and the luminal, uh, and we are going for uh, a triple negative breast cancer in the future, and pancreatic cancer. And which roadblocks are you finding? What's that? Are well, you, uh, you can find a clinical GOV, uh, already three clinical GOV uh, in the uh, net. Just look at uh, either WST11 or TUCAD, and you will find uh, accrual in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, uh, for the pancreatic cancer, we are looking for landing the first clinical trial in a year. That's what the clinician there want. I thought it may take a year and a half, but they really are very strong because they say we are ready. Not sure, although I'm the basic researcher, I want to make sure that it works. But yes, as I've said in the beginning, it's a general platform for solid tumors uh, in solid organs, but even more easily in endoluminal cavities. Uh, so um, it can be applied to uh, lungs, uh, to kidneys, to urinary tract, to esophageal cancer, and so forth. Kavod, William. Um, I am a physician, I am a doctor, uh, finished in Brazil, and then I went to Israel. I specialized in psychiatry at uh, Beit Cholim Adassa in Kerem, uh, Yerushalayim. Weizmann, uh, a proud, that's something that makes me proud, that I saw, I live it for many, many years. I'm a Procopensi. Nascido, alguns se dizem mal criados, em Cornélio Procópio, norte pioneiro do Paraná. But I said, where I come from, not from capital, from here, Caipira, we say. Uh, but many years, 80 years in Jerusalem. But uh, I would like to put something of myself on my question. Two years ago, I discovered that I have, doesn't matter, transex today here in Brazil, we're talking very much about transex, cisgender, 
and so forth, big political question. And I had to go a diagnosis that only macho, only men, they must to be macho, has this disease. That's a cancer. Doesn't matter how you see yourself, your genetic, C gener, R gener, doesn't matter. If you have prostate, if you can have prostate cancer, congratulations, you're a man. If you're not, you're not. And I had, uh, I did the radiotherapy. I, I got, uh, unfortunately, I was Glasgow 8. So even in the 70s. Well, we are going now, the clinical trial in the most. Okay, so you have a guinea um, pig or a rat, that we start, about uh, rat and mice, you can choose me as yeah. a mice or a... Depends I, on your I behavior. Really, I, no, no problem. And uh, what caught me the attention was brilliant idea, uh, brilliant. Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, nitric oxygen, it's a, it's a gas that they use for anesthesia that can keep love, uh, love uh, gas that make people laugh. Uh, and then, but I, I understood uh, first, why go to the prostate or any cancer? Uh, there is any, why go to, uh, from prostate? Why only prosthetic cells? It's not prosthetic cells. It's the whole tumor. The whole, the whole tumor. The whole tumor. As one organism. As an one, organ, yeah. One organism that is smart, but not very smart because it kills it. The idea what you kill where he lives. He's gonna die together. So I'm doing today. I got my injection every three months. Doc and uh, at the 15 PSA for medicine. Today I have 0 0.20. And everybody knows that uh, sex is not important. The question that uh, why it gets without the light go to metastasis, where do you not. have micrometastasis? It is all over the circulation. It's all over the body, and it's in your body for a couple of hours. But it's completely non-toxic, as I said, if no light goes on. So we illuminate the area of the two. With it, we illuminate only the area of the two, uh, primarily. And then, we area, because of the specific properties of the tumor, you will have a collapse of the Then you have immune response. We hope, that's what we are trying now, that these immune cells will find out any traces of tumor cells all over you. We let them do the work. Okay. Um, professor, congratulations for your, for your work, for your brain. And uh, I would like to know uh, how is the approval process uh, with the FDA and all over the world okay, of this treatment? So, so as I've said, FDA tried approval for the uh, phase three clinical trials. It was like five years ago. Uh, they did not want. We had discussion, they said, unless you compare it for about 10 years or 20 years from radical prostatectomy or whatever, we do not know because you can live with prostate cancer, in particular at the early stage, for a long time. After the results that we got in Europe and the approval in Europe, uh, the company applied to them again and the whole picture changed completely. Now the FDA works with the company to define exactly uh, what will be the rules? They take it as because we, uh, the company, perform what we call um, a comparative study. 200 people that were treated, 200 people that were under active surveillance, showed the clear benefit. And the clear benefit is not on mortality; is on prevention of radical treatment. And the FDA accepted it, and together with the company, now prepare the uh, post-marketing protocol. So we hope that within a short time they will have approved to that because they prepare it together with the company, which is quite unique and it's a very good sign. Um, the company already got approval, as far as I know, by Invisa for the device. And hopefully uh, they ask a few questions uh, on the submission. Uh, they get renewed with the uh, submission and I hope that within less than a year it will be approved in, in Brazil. Uh, this is in a process of approval. 
So I hope it answers your question. Professor. Yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the genius of making something very complex look so simple. <laughs> it's like seeing a top soccer player playing. It looks so simple, so easy. Uh, I have two questions. The second one, uh, you can't even forget. But uh, the one, uh, you are speaking about plants and natural kingdom. Um, how does this relate to two things? The, uh, medicine practi practiced by Indians and by Africans and TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, which probably on an empirical way is very much based on observation uh, and how it affects. So what, how would you see the progression of research like yours? Well, I, yeah, um, you know, this is more like a cultural question. I, I will try to, to answer it in practical terms. I think um, definitely there is a lot in natural medicine. I mean, in medicine that is based on long-term experience. The problem is uh, that uh, most of these uh, practical approaches like, and excuse me, it's not that uh, we, we definitely know, I mean, I guess all of us, or chicken soup, very good, uh, and, and definitely it helps. I know that in our family it helps. Uh, we don't know yet why, uh, and I'm not mocking here, I'm not joking, I'm saying it very seriously. The problem is that most of these things have not been tried in what we call organized clinical trial. And so, um, you know, like acupuncture, uh, you have definitely people that benefit from it. I would expect that what makes it easier to be implemented today is the concept of personal medicine, which means that there are a certain group of people that will benefit from a certain kind of therapy. And within the frame of personal medicine, you can also try to see if this natural medicine that have been experienced by hundreds and thousands of years, uh, different type of plants and so forth, that definitely have ingredients that can turn into, into like taxol. Taxol is based on plants. Abraxan, the composition of taxol, and um, serum albumin, which is used against many cancers. Pretty effective, at least for a certain stage. This was originally taken from uh, wood barks. And so it is a kind of a natural medicine that was found to be effective. So I think that uh, within this era, many of these different medical sources will be tried and may find very useful. Yeah. And a last question. Uh, how does your research relate to Judas Volkman's and your genesis? Well, uh, OK, this is an excellent question, I think. Uh, uh, and this relates to what you asked, actually. Judah Folkman, uh, <coughs> unfortunately, uh, looked merely at the occlusion of the vessels, uh, merely at stopping the vascular supply. Uh, and that's what I refer to by saying that uh, cutting the lifelines. But it was clear that this is not enough. Uh, and so you have to find a way to overcome, not just avoid uh, vessels from functioning, but also actively kill the cancer cells and the other cells of the microenvironment. Because it's known today, which Joda Folkman did not realize, that many of the uh, cells within the tumor microenvironment, like macrophages, will recruit very rapidly new blood vessels. And so when Judah put the uh, original Avastin or the other thing and tried to avoid the uh, vessels for proliferation, the small vessels, actually it has been used later on by Rakesh Jain and other people to normalize existing blood vessels in order to make chemotherapy go better into these cells. And the male use of Avastin as a standalone therapy is abundant in many, many cases that have a very big hooray in the beginning, like breast cancer and other, and it's used today only in combination with other therapies. 
uh, because you actually normalize the blood vessel rather than stopping them because they will reproliferate very rapidly. And actually, as a standalone, it can cause metastasis, at least in animal studies. So Judah Falkman was the first to implement the idea, let's treat the tumor microenvironment, but he paid attention to one particular part of the tumor microenvironment. So it was genius, but not enough. But you have one nice a very quick question. Um, is the treatment available now in Europe? Or, I mean, still well, it, it's a commercially, uh, you know, uh, you need the, uh, what the company is doing is getting approval of the insurance company. It is privately improved, approved in many places, but the idea is to get, so they got already in Germany, they are getting now in Italy, they are getting in France. So what about the UK? Uh, the UK did not want this treatment uh, for uh, insurance because they say 98% of our patients, the low risk, are going to active surveillance. Oh, and we wow. don't care more. We are not going to enter now a method that will, call, uh, uh, that will cause the taxpayer. So we are doing it, uh, the company is doing it on a private base. We are now entering, uh, there is uh, a big shot there, Freddie Hamdi in Oxford, who is running now a huge okay. clinical trial against um, um, prostatectomy. And we are going to Gleason 7. Gleason 7, which is grade 2. A uh, yeah, no, grade two. Seven, uh, yeah. This is going to be approved in the UK yeah, as well. I know someone who has got a it's, um, four, uh, four plus four. Plus so four, four, four is, yeah. is already very high. Yeah, it's it's very grade high. A two, so three. In already. England, and uh, you know, we're very interested. And so hopefully, the Gleason Seven now is do. run. Uh, a, a, a clinical trial is run in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Fifty patients. Mm -hmm. More than half of them have already been treated in a very short time, and it looks very, very encouraging. Very, can, very encouraging. Yeah, so and the FDA actually, yeah. uh, together with the company, yeah. wants to get approval for Gleason 6 and 7 at okay. the same time. So I think that then it will be all over the world. Before we finish, my preferred question that I have formulated for many people from Weizmann here. But, but you know, this is a synagogue, religious place. Some rabbis are here, is listening to you, including my teacher of Torah and Talmud. So my question is for you, where do you see the, the, the crossroads between religion and science? Uh, well, I would, uh, I, th this is a very complicated question. Um, there are many, many answers to that. I will just start by saying that the owner, the company, is highly orthodox Jew. So we have this discussion often. And the name of the medicine is Tukad. And Tukad Hararei El is based on, on, on um, a sentence from Vaikra, from the Bible. Uh, it is the, uh, the ever-sustaining uh, fire on, in the temple. So uh, now, where is the crosstalk? Um, I, I think it is, um, I'm going to be a bit uh, more than you expected. Uh, if we read Job, uh, we have a man that confronted many troubles in his life and keep answering why. And he does not have the answer. Uh, and he says, and he, un he asks many questions concerning the stork in the sky and the, and the uh, stones and the trouble of human being and why did I? All these questions uh, can be attempted to be answered in a scientific manner. And I'm saying attempted to be answered because definitely on many of them you do not have answer. But you can go the scientific way to try to answer them. The scientific way is um, a didactical um, way of contra and pro, you know, uh, dialectic manner. Uh, there is no other way to go in science than by dialectic, uh, because uh, you want, and many times I, when I get a, uh, a research that say, we want to prove that, I'm saying this is a wrong definition. You want to test. You want to test your hypothesis, whether it's wrong or right. You are, should be ready to get a wrong, you, you get an answer, no, you are wrong. And as Peristeli said, bumping our head in the wall is more important than having some kind of uh, gray answer. 
So I think that the dialectic manner of getting into whatever you seek the truth is common to, in particular, to the Jewish religion. Um, this is the basic of Talmud. You try to be Epicurus. You try to contradict the common truth. You try to ask question, and you try to answer this question, and then another question is raised up, and you try to answer it. So the way I think of um, the active believer, not the passive believer, that get whatever he is or she is told, but rather exploring, want to understand, want to ask harsh questions, and therefore I brought Jov, uh, is, is the common thing. Uh, there are definitely things that we do not know to answer, um, like the Big Bang. I mean, uh, you can say, well, there was a uh, reversal of entropy in the very beginning. Everything was condensed in one little thing that exploded all of a sudden. This is uh, an answer that can go in many ways, but the point is singular. And in a singular point, you do not really understand what happened before. And so you can get an answer uh, by saying, this is an old mighty, this is some force that I do not understand. But you can then, um, the question is whether in order to go uh, and to answer your questions, uh, you say, well, uh, what was written in the Bible is what I should believe it. Or like Job, you should ask questions. I believe in the Job way, and I think this is the common way of, of science. And But you have to be very careful, because like, again, in the religion, when you go to the orchard, you know, the Kabbalah, you can get crazy by frustration. Same with science. So you have to be well equipped when you go and start to ask questions, and you have to be ready to get a negative answer. This is how you develop your experience. And there is a lot of suffering and joy, which I think very is good. common. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the people here, for the people listening. Sure.